Judges chapter number 7, verse number 1. I'll read a few verses and we'll dive into our series of Welcome to Victory, part 2. And today we're going to be preaching on the possibility of victory. I believe it is possible for every born again believer to operate in victory in your life. I'm not here and preaching health and wealth and a prosperity gospel. I'm not here to say that if you come down this aisle and get saved that God's going to deposit a million dollars into your bank account. Although if he did, I would not object. Somebody say amen right there. (laughs) That's not what the Bible teaches. I'm not talking about monetary or physical things, but I believe that a victory in the Christian life is a place that you and I can get to. Uh, that uh, will change everything about it. You can walk through a storm and still operate in victory. You can walk through a valley and still operate in victory. Aren't you tired of every little whim and every little wave and every little wind knocking you out of the victory that you want to have for your life? I believe it is possible for us to walk through this life and experience victory no matter what we face from day to day. Judges chapter number 7 verse 1, Then Jeroboam, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. Verse 2, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. That doesn't make sense, does it? There are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, uh, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from the Mount Gilead, and there return to the people twenty and two thousand, and there remain ten thousand. So we started off with 32,000. God says that's too much. He said, go tell them if they're afraid to go home. And 22,000 people walked away. Now we got 10,000 people. Verse number 4, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. By the time God's done with this process, it goes from 32,000 to 10,000, to 300. Now Gideon has to face a battle with 300 men against a host and an army that was like the sands of the sea, the Bible says. Camels that are unnumberable and uh, all this. And Gideon now has to take 300 men and fight the battle and, and want to win a victory with only 300 men. I want to deal with this subject this morning on the possibility of victory. What do you do when you, don't, when you feel like you don't have what you need to be victorious? What do you do when you feel like you don't have what it's going to take to be victorious? I'm here to tell you that it is still possible to be victorious even when you feel like you don't have what it takes. Father, help us now uh, through the power of your word. Give us exactly what we stand in need of. For all that you do, we'll be careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said. Amen. Uh, number one today, if you're taking notes, we want to look in, at, at the possibility of victory. And we study the life of Gideon. And we find that the life of Gideon teaches us that victory is possible no matter the time. Victory is possible no matter the time. The time. Yesterday I got on Facebook and did a live uh, video there and many of you all interacted with me and I, and I asked the question, what it is that you feel like you need to be victorious in your life? I was amazed at some of the answers. Some people said, I feel like if I had love in my life, then I would be victorious. Some people talk about circumstances they have lived through and they said, I feel like if I was able to muster up forgiveness for someone, then if I had that amount of forgiveness, then that would be removed and I could be victorious in my life. I heard others talk about if we, had, if we just had a little bit more money to do this, then we could feel victorious in our life. But 
I, I come to submit to you that victory is not a thing. Your possibility of you experiencing victory in your life is not a thing. It's a person. Victory, you, you, you can fill in with every, every, every one of those things that you want to fill in. A money, a house, a car, a for, all these different things. You can fill that in with all you want. Uh, but victory is not a thing. Victory is a person. Amen. Write this down. Holiness is not the way to Christ. Christ is the way to holiness. Amen. See, all y'all, we keep telling ourselves, well, if I just had this, or if I just had that, if I, if I just had a bigger bank account, if I just had a nicer car, if I just had this, then I could operate in victory, but I come to declare unto you that I have met people that didn't have 10, to, 10 cents to rub together, and I've met people that have more money than they could count, and happiness is, is on both ends. It does not relate. Money does not equate happiness. What relates is not what you got, it's who you got that lives down on the inside that makes all the difference in this world. I come to tell you that victory is possible no matter what you're going through. Number one, victory is possible no matter the time. I don't have time to go through all this. I'm already hungry, so i got to preach fast. Somebody say amen. Chapter number 6 goes into all this and tells you and I that the Israelites had done evil in the sight of God. They had lived in wickedness. Therefore, they had turned their back on God nearly every time. I do not understand Israel. I mean, they get delivered out of Egypt. God blesses them. God takes them out of bondage. And, and, and they should know that it was the God of heaven that provided for them. No sooner do they get in a place of victory, they turn their back on God, set up all these false idols and these false gods and start doing evil in the sight of God. What does God do? God knows that God's people do not prosper in days of prosperity so we see God has to lift the hedge and here come the Midianites and all these enemies in and they're spoiling them, they're stealing everything from them and now the people of Israel have been brought out of bondage from Egypt, they've been delivered from all those things and here they are again captive and they are in bondage and they are under war against the Midianites all because they chose to turn their back on God look right here in my God given eyeball you can choose your sin but you don't get to choose your consequences you can choose your sin but you don't get to choose your consequences you had God created you with the free will. And yes, you can go do what you want to do. And yes, you can go act how you want to act and live how you want to live. But I promise you, by the time sin begins to fester its way in your life, you will not be happy with the consequences of your choice. There ain't no perfect people in this building. The reason we can shout is because there's a bunch of people that learned the bitter taste of our sin and we learned that we could cry out to God and we learned that there was a God in heaven that would hear our cry and deliver us from our sin. It, when we shout, don't be mistaken, that doesn't mean that we're perfect. That doesn't mean that we got everything all together. It just means we got some memories in our past of when we were in way worse shape than we are today and we're not here to praise me or them or those or the church. We're here because there was a God in heaven that when we acted a fool and we acted foolishly there was a God that delivered us when we cried upon his name Victory is possible no matter what the time. You, I got, do your homework, go home, study chapter number six. They've turned their back on God. The Midianites have destroyed them. They have come in and wiped them out. And now the people of Israel, who should be a strong nation, have ran and hid in the caves. Gideon is actually found in the wine press, threshing wheat in the wine press when he should have been on the threshing floor at the top of the mountain where the wind was blowing to help him thresh wheat. But he's doing it in the wine press. Why? Because he's hiding. He's hiding from the Midianites because the Midianites are stealing everything they have. The Jewish people are going to starve to death because every livestock, every, everything they've got has been stolen by the Midianites and the people of Israel are in despair. 
They are in doom and they are in gloom. The days are worse than they've ever been before. And in this day, it looks like the people of God are going to be wiped out. It looks like there's no victory on the horizon. But watch me, they lived in this bondage for seven whole years. And at the end of those seven years, finally they got the point. And somebody said, you know what? Things were a whole lot better when we were letting God control us. Things were a lot better when we allowed God to be in control of our nation and they finally got together and they cried out to God and they said, God, forgive us for turning our back on you. God, forgive us for doing it our way instead of your way. And look here, I, I, I got thrilled this morning when I was reading this because it could have been God that said, no, you made your bed, now sleep in it. It could have been a God that was hateful and mean that said, no, you got exactly what you deserve. But, but we serve a God that is so full of love and so full of mercy that when they called upon His name, the God of heaven begin to work things in the process to deliver his people. Amen. He sends a prophet. The prophet comes and prophesies and preaches to that nation and tells them that God is going to raise up a deliverer. And they're threshing wheat in the wine press, hiding from the enemy. The angel of the Lord shows up to Gideon and tells Gideon, that God's going to use him to be a deliverer and a judge. Chapter number 6, verse 12, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. He's hiding in the wine press, threshing wheat, and God calls him a mighty man of valor. Aren't you glad that God sees you for what you can be instead of where you are currently? Aren't you glad that in the worst days when you're hiding out and you ain't got nothing to offer God, God doesn't see you for who you are and where you are. God sees you for what you're going to do in the future. Some of y'all, if God would have got you for what you are, He'd have gave up on you a long time ago, but He didn't leave you the way He found you. He's got something in mind for you, and He called Him a mighty man of valor. I read this and I couldn't help but think about the day and hour in which Gideon was chose to be used by God to bring victory to that land. And I couldn't help but think about America. It is possible to experience the victory that God has for life no matter what the time is. Ladies and gentlemen, I remind you that spiritually speaking in our nation, in our world, we are living in dark days, are we not? We are living in despairing days. We're living in uh, one of the greatest, probably the greatest nation in the entire world, uh, Israel and America, the only two nations in the entire world where our constitution was founded upon biblical principles. I mean, look how fast America has grown and prospered and is what it is today. And listen to me, I'm not here to be disrespectful, but America's not what it is today because of our money and America's not what it is today because of our manpower and I have no disrespect for our military but America's not what it is today because of our military. America is the nation that we are today because the blessing of God and the hand of God that has been upon our nation and upon this day and hour the Bible said blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Your money don't equate blessing your military don't equate blessing but there was some men that started this nation that said we are founding this nation to be a nation under God indivisible for liberty and justice for all and ladies and gentlemen the blessing of God and the hand of God has been upon this nation old time revivals and camp meetings and churches and Holy Ghost filled preachers have paved the way for this nation to be a nation where the blessing of God and the hand of God could be upon it today and listen to me America has turned its back on God did you hear me I said America has turned its back on God. Now we can't even balance a budget. We don't know which bathroom we're supposed to use. We've lost our mind. Things are upside down. We're divided politically. We're divided economically. We're divided socially. We're divided racially. At what point in time are you and I going to understand it's not more money we need. It's not nicer this that we need. At some point in time, somebody's got to get a burden and get on an altar and say, oh God, forgive us of our sin. We've got to have God back in our nation once again. Somebody praise God if you believe that. Yeah. 
Victory is possible no matter I got plumb happy. Because there's a, there's a voice of the enemy. You've got to acknowledge it. That'll say stuff like this. The best days are behind you. The church will never be what it used to be. The church cannot operate in the victory that it used to operate in. But I come to tell you that the devil is a liar. And victory, when we study the life of Gideon, it tells us that victory is possible no matter what time it is. It doesn't matter who's in Washington, D.C. It don't matter if the Federal Bank goes bankrupt. It don't matter if Apple goes bankrupt. Hear me, we're operating on a promise that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And if every, oh, hey, if everything turns upside down tomorrow, the church is marching on because the promise is not based on money. It's the promise of God. And you and I as the people of God ought to rise up as a mighty people and say all of hell can come against the church. But all of hell is no match against the church because God is our Father. Heaven is our home. And we can have victory in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Victory is possible no matter the time. Victory is possible second of all. I done forgot, no matter, the, I just wrote it this morning, y'all give me a break. No matter the talent, no matter the talent, Gideon uh, recruits 32,000 people against a much larger army than that. God tells him, those that are fearful, send them home. 32,000, 22,000 leave. 10,000 are left. He was already behind. 10,000. And he tells them, well, there's still too many. He takes it down even more to where there's only 300 left. You know, number one, God, God in, in this thing, for Vic, God loves to use common people. Common people. You study the life of Gideon, they wasn't nothing special about the life of Gideon. You may be here and you say, I'm just a common person. I don't sing in the choir, which I think a bunch of y'all ought to start singing in the choir. Say amen right there. Uh, I don't sing in the choir. I can't do this or that. But God can use common people amen. if you just avail yourself to being used for His glory. Number two, God uses clean people. The first thing God did when he was messing around with Gideon, he said all, all these false idols. Gideon's daddy was involved in some of this among the town and, and they had set up all these false idols and in the middle of the night, Gideon went by and destroyed all them false idols. All them things that God didn't agree with. He just went down there and started dealing with all of them and all them men, they come out and they was going to kill Gideon and all that goes along with that. But, but we see that Gideon's first job was to cast down all the false idols and if you want to experience, I, hate to, I hope you didn't come to church for your ears to be tickled and everything just to feel good speech because that's not what you're going to get today. If you want to experience victory, there are some things that you and I are going to have to do and that is we've got to clean things up in our life. God can't bless dirty. These idols that were up in that place, they had to get rid of them. God will not take second place in your life. No, 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 no. no. God will not take Second place. He, you got to be clean and repentant of your sin and clean before God. And you say, well, preacher, I just don't experience victory in my life. I'd ask you this. Is your life clean before God? That doesn't mean you're perfect. It's not what I'm trying to say. All of us are flawed. I plan on being a glutton for lunch. Yeah. All, yeah, I'm going to go bury myself in Bobby's barbecue and just dig my way out. I can't wait. I've got to hurry up this sermon. I, 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 all, none of us are perfect. It's not what I'm saying. But there's a difference in not being perfect and living in open sin to the place where you've just excused it and expect God to be okay with whatever you want to do. The biggest enemy, and I'm not here to make nobody mad, I'm not here to preach nobody, I'm preaching to myself. The biggest enemy I have 
is me. Yes, sir. I stop myself from experiencing victory. Because my flesh is so strong and my flesh wants what's best for CT and my flesh wants this and that. But hear me, if we want victory, we've got to learn to say, God, not my way, but your way and, and, and get things cleaned and repented before God. I was in the office this morning. I said, God, don't you let anything be there that will hinder the touch of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God from flowing into our lives. I remember like, a, like it was yesterday, one of the, me and Becky never got in a fight. I remember Doc Brown in the marriage council, he told us, he said, if you can make it through the first year, everything will be wonderful past that. I remember thinking in marriage council, that woman's so pretty, what in the world would I ever be mad at that thing for, you know? And I won't go into no details, but it was about six or seven months into that thing, we had a doozy. It was Sunday morning, y'all. And I ain't going to go in details because what's in the, under the blood is under the blood and we're just going to leave it back here. But I remember pulling on the parking lot and we, we pulled up right here in this building. We pulled up in this property. She was mad as the devil. I was mad as the devil. We walked in. Becky was stomping going up in there, you know, doing her thing. And we walked in those doors. There's something about Baptist people. As soon as you walk on the church ground, everything just turns fine. You know, Becky went from talking with that deep voice that she was talking mad at me to, hey, sister, oh, girl, you look so pretty in that dress, you know, all that stuff. Oh, girl, you working it today now. I mean, she's just doing her thing. I'm over, hey, brother, good to be in the house of God today. It was such a blessing to be with the Lord today. Amen. I mean, you know, and all of what's going on with that, we got up there. Becky went to her side of the choir. I went to my side of the choir. My hand before God. Preacher Brown walked up here to the pulpit, and he, he, opened, he was going to open up there. He said, I'll tell you what we're going to do today. He said, to start this service off. C.T. and Becky, y'all come sing us a song. <laughs> and I remember thinking, oh, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, get me out of here. You say, why was you so nervous? Because I know God's not going to bless what we're about to do because there is ought. You say, you saying God cares when me and my wife argue? It don't mean you're never going to argue. It means that you've got the strength to make it right after you do. Amen. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> you hear all these people say thank you today? <laughs> Thanks, because they's fighting this morning. They know what they're talking about. <laughs> Could it be you're not experiencing the victory that you desire because... You got too much pride stopping you from making things right. Let me ask you a question. Who do you need to say, I'm sorry to? <laughs> Y'all ain't shouting no more. <laughs> Who do you need to go to and make things right with? It don't matter if it was 20 years ago, 10 years ago, or five minutes ago. And you know what? If he's honest, your soul don't either. That's right. It's very hard, very, very, very possible for your soul to be forgiven and your heart still feel guilty. You need to make things right and be clean. Get all that stuff out of the way so you can walk in the victory that God has for your life. Boy, I'm having fun today. He uses common people. He uses clean people. He uses courageous people. He uses courageous people. Uh, he said, I want you, if, if anybody's afraid, send them home. Don't worry about it. Just send them home if they're afraid. 22,000 walk away. 10,000 are left. Gideon is like, hey, God, what you trying to do to me? He said, they still too many for me to deliver the Midianites. He said, I want you to take them down to the water. And it's a strange request. But he says, everybody that gets down on their knees and drinks from the water, everybody that gets on their knees and drinks the water will send them home because they did like this. I began to wonder what in the world was there to that. The, the, the 300 
that didn't do that, the enemy's right over there. And these boys ain't got enough sense to worry about the enemy. They're more, con more concerned about getting a drink than they are concerned about being courageous enough to know that there's an enemy right there that could strike. And if everybody's turned their back on their enemy, God's dealing with those that don't have enough caution about them. The 300 that got accepted got a drink like this. Anybody with me? These boys didn't have no sense. These boys knew there's an enemy right there. <laughs> Some of y'all need to understand there's a real enemy. And the real enemy wants to pick you off. And listen to me, God was choosing the men from the boys. And then boys that didn't have enough sense to know, understand who the real enemy was, he said, just get rid of them. And the best thing you can do in your life, those people that don't understand who the real enemy is, you can just learn, hey, I'm not against you, I'm not, I don't hate you, but I've got to find me a core of people that know who the enemy is and know how to fight the enemy. And so we see 32,000 went to 10,000 and 10,000 went to 300. God used the word vaunt. He said, I, he said, I, I, I got I to gotta break it down so that Israel doesn't vaunt themselves before God. So that Israel doesn't think that we're so strong. We defeated the Midianites. See, thirdly, victory is possible no matter the task. Could you imagine... As Gideon tells God, God, I had 32,000. I was already behind. Now I had 10,000, and you took that away from me, and I was behind then. Now I've only got 300. I read one number today that was estimated probably around 135 soldiers on the other side against 300 people. Victory is possible no matter have you ever been put up against an impossible task that you felt like there was no way that you had what it takes for the possibility of victory to come into your favor? 300 people against 135,000 people. I'm putting myself in Gideon's shoes. I probably would have went to Waffle House and hid out for a couple hours. Gideon takes 300 men. You read the story later. I don't have time to go through all of it, but he goes down there and he gets those 300 men. Uh, he doesn't put swords in their hands. He don't put a gun in their hands or a rock in their hand. He puts a trumpet in their hand, a vessel in their hand, and he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he sets them up, 100 over there, 100 here, another 100 over there. And he said, when I go to blowing the trumpet, you blow your trumpet and shout the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. In the middle of the night, the Midianites are resting down there in that valley. And Gideon gets his trumpet out and has 100 over there, 100 over there, and 100 here. And in the middle of the night, those 300 men started giving it everything they had, blowing those trumpets and throwing their pitchers on the ground, smashing them and breaking them. And the noise that came from Gideon and his men brought such a fear upon those 135 men down in the valley that they begin to tremble and they begin to fear, thinking that there were way more up there than what there really were up there. And your Bible tells us that fear fell on them in such a strong way that all of those massive Midianite army took off running and hiding from the enemy. I come to tell somebody, you don't need everything that you think you need in order to be victorious because victory is not a thing. Victory is a person. Gideon did not win the battle that day. God won the battle that day. And all over this 
this room, there are battles in front of you and armies in front of you that the devil has told you that there's no way you can defeat it, no way you can get around it, but I come to declare it against you to you today that if God is on your side, you are the majority today. If God be for us, who can be against us? It doesn't matter what the devil throws at us. We can be victorious in this thing called life. There's something, Ben's coming to the piano, there's something about those trumpets. There's something about those trumpets. How could a trumpet beat an enemy? I wrote something down. I'll give this to you, and I'll be on my way. They cried out and made sounds of victory instead of sounds of despair. They could have whined and cried and said, we only got 300. But they rose above and, and, and started making sounds of victory instead of sounds of despair. You and I can make sounds as well. Somebody say amen right there. There is something about your praise that scares hell to death. There is something about our worship that scares the devil to death when you're facing an impossible situation and you're facing an impossible battle that there's no way you can win and you don't understand, but we have faith in but God and we believe in God and when we go ahead and praise God on credit and go ahead and thank God on credit and we go ahead and say, God, you are the victor. You are the winner. The battle is yours. The battle's not mine. I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know when you're going to do it. Do it. I don't know where you're going to do it, but I believe you're going to do it because greater is He that is in me than He that is in the world. It's all right to quote the Bible. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. God is my Father. Heaven is my home. You're a good God. You've never failed me yet, and you're not going to start today. You're the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Hey, you need to quit telling God how big your problem is, and you need to start telling your problem how big your God is, and start testify to that thing in your life and remind the devil that the devil may have some power but God has all power and the devil has never defeated God yet and the devil's not going to start today. We serve a God that is victorious. I wonder right here at Victory Baptist Church, could we practice what we're preaching and lift our voices and clap our hands and praise God and make a noise and give God a shout and say God you are able you're able God you're able to defeat the enemy on our behalf bless your name praise your holy name you're a good God the possibility of victory God through his son Jesus has provided everything you'll ever need to be victorious it's not a thing it's a person if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your savior you are missing out on the greatest gift in this world. The Bible said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Today, you can accept that gift of salvation and walk out of here in the freedom and victory that God has for your life.